Good morning. Um, just, a, just a few announcements before we get started. First of all, um, at the end of, at the end of your pews, you'll find you know you'll find these fancy brown friendship folders. Um, please fill them out. It, it 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 makes the welcomers' jobs a lot easier, um, and just everyone involved. If you just take the approximately thirty seconds it takes to put your name in here, so that would be greatly appreciated. Um, other than that. In, in inside of your bulletins, you will find um, it's in the it's it's in it's in the top middle, right underneath where it says announcements. Um, there, you will find your encouragement of the week, um, and the purpose of that is just um, it it just maybe maybe someone that uh, that needs some encouragement, whether that be from whether that be from a phone call. A, sending a card in the mail um typically uh typically the all, all the information that you would need would be in there and if it's not it's probably because the person is in is in the directory and if you do not if you do not have one ask pastor raven because i don't know where they are so um <laughs> Uh, next up, uh, our, our, our Tuesday community prayer meeting, uh, is, is, is at 11 o'clock, uh, I think, yeah, 11 o'clock. <laughs> well, you never put, you never put that part on there, so, um, and, and that is for, for the month of April, um, it, it is being, it is being hosted at the First Christian Church. Um, n next, uh, be be between, be between Christian education and our, and our morning celebration, we, we have a time of, we have a, a time of prayer in the, in, in the Reaper's room. Um, if, if, if you have any further questions about that, you can, uh, talk to Debbie, uh, to, Talk to Debbie Kelly about that, um, and and yeah, just anyone that wants to be a part of it is more than welcome. Holy moly, Ashton, you're huge. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I haven't seen him in a while. <laughs> and then you hear all the cackling and laughing in the other building. The miners are here. Okay, <laughs> if you all want to say hi to them. Hi! All right. <laughs> and then, and then, and then, and then, my final announcement is that on on May fifth, we will be uh, we will be having our annual elections for for the members for members of the board, and I think there's a, a couple other things that get voted on at that point. So. You, you you definitely want to make sure you, you want to make sure that uh, you are here for that because I do not believe we take mail in ballots so uh, <laughs> um, and, and with that that's all I got.
Welcome. How you all doing this morning? God is doing amazing things in my life. God is doing amazing things in our lives, and I am so glad that you are here with us this morning. And I just realized why it was so loud over in the annex is Adeline was over there also. <laughs> yes, I know. We heard. We heard. Door opened up. Ah! I'm just kidding. Anyways, I'm glad everybody is here this morning. We're going to have a fantastic time celebrating, worshiping God, and just meeting with Him this morning. It's great to be here. And I am so glad that everybody is here this morning, and I'm glad that those that are online are also here this morning. It is an amazing time. God has been doing some amazing things, and when I look back over the last couple of weeks, I am just amazed at what God is doing. So we're going to do something this morning that we don't normally do. What amazing thing has God done in your life recently? Michael got a new bike. That's pretty amazing. <laughs> okay, so God hasn't really been amazing this morning. <laughs> well, neither are you. <laughs> yeah. I'm not going to just, that's okay. No one wants to speak this morning. I, I, I threw that at you, and, and that's okay. Usually somebody like Adeline has something to say. <laughs> Thank you. All right, well, we'll just move right on. Since Marcus was so eager to read, go ahead, Marcus. <laughs> Sing to the Lord a new song, for he has done marvelous things. His right hand and his holy, and, and his holy arm have worked salvation for him. The Lord has made his salvation known and revealed his righteousness to the nations. He has remembered his love and his faithfulness to Israel. All the ends of the earth have seen the salvation of our God. Shout for joy to the Lord, all the earth. Burst into jubilant song with music. Make music to the Lord with the harp, with the harp and the sound of with the harp and the sound of singing. With trumpets and the blast of the, of the ram's horn, shout for joy before the Lord, the King. Let the sea resound in everything in it, the world and all who live in it. Let the rivers clap their hands. Let the mountains sing together for joy. Let them sing before the Lord, for he comes to judge the earth. We will judge the world in righteousness and the peoples, in, and the peoples with equity. Let's pray. Lord, I thank you. I thank you for the opportunity that you give us to come here and worship you. Um, and I just I just pray that as we as we go out, as we go throughout our service, just to help us help us to 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 make a joyful noise unto you and to remember and to and and to remember ultimately we are here to worship you um open open our open our 
open our ears so that we can so that you can so that we can hear what what you have to tell us and open um open our minds so that we are available to receive it and 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 again just just open our mouths and our hearts as we as 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 we stand here and worship you today and ask this in your name amen please stand and join me singing no why don't you guys stay seated for a second oh okay <laughs> oh <laughs> sorry we're going to take a compassionate ministry offering now adeline don't worry about it i didn't call you because i remembered um i remembered that i didn't call you at 9 30 last night and i didn't think it was worth <laughs> texting you and saying hey can you throw something together but our compassionate we have been doing a lot with our compassionate ministry and Adeline, uh, this past week when I was putting, when I was looking at some of the reports and some of the things in the C Compassionate Ministry account, there was like a long list of people that we gave some encouragement money to and just money to help and say, hey, here's, here's a couple of dollars here. Here's, and I thought that was pretty cool that we have done a lot with this. And the offering basically is that we, we once a month we take an offering and that offering goes to anybody that has a need. We have been doing so well <laughs> that, that the, the offering is a little bit low right now, but we've been doing really well with being able to meet the needs of our local church as they, as they arrive. And it's been a great, awesome ministry within our church. So we're going to take the Compassionate Ministry offering. Please do not put your tithes and offerings in. We, that will be in a separate, uh, that will be at the end of the service in a separate offering and uh, a little compassionate ministry music. <laughs> Now you can stand. And we're going to praise God with our voices. Make a joyful noise. For some of us, it's going to be a noise. <laughs>
this morning, if you would like to come to the altar, you may come forward. If you would like to come to the altar and just pray, you can kneel on this side of the altar and you can pray by yourself in the presence of Jesus. If you'd like to be anointed this morning by one of the staff, you can come and kneel at this side of the altar and one of the staff members will come and pray with you. God is doing amazing things. God is in the healing process. And God is going to do amazing things in people's lives. There's a couple of things, a couple of prayer requests that I have that are not in your bulletin. Um, there's a little girl named Julietta. It's the brother. It's, it's, it's Debbie's brother's grandchild. And uh, she's going through some tough times right now. And just pray for her that God will guide the doctors in healing her. And, and keep uh, Ruth Kenny in your prayers. Um, she's, she is 90, 90 years old. Many of us don't know Ruth. She attended here a long time ago. She's a wonderful lady. She's just 90 years old. And just keep her and her family in your prayers as God, as, 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 as to guide them as to how to care for Ruth. Those are just two rare prayer requests that aren't in your bulletins, uh, and we haven't really shared those. And if you'd like to come forward right now, we're going to spend some time lifting our requests, lifting our prayers to God. Lord, these are our requests to you. You are a God that listens. Thank you, God. Hear our prayers. amazing, glorious, wonderful God. Thank you for being here with us. Thank you for touching lives and moving. Thank you for the Spirit of God. In your name. Amen.
like you to, <coughs> I find it interesting, seriously, um, I, I did take a shower this morning, okay, <coughs> I, showed a, I showed a cartoon on the uh, projector a few weeks ago of everybody packed into the back pews, piled up on to each other, some of you really didn't like it, but you have no idea what the church looks like right now, it is hilarious. To see everybody packed 10 rows back because <laughs> you don't want to get close to me. And, and the sad thing is uh, even Orville is back there. Uh, <laughs> I'm like, where's Orville and Cheryl? Did they d ditch me this morning? Orville's back there all by himself it's, you know, because Cheryl's doing something. And it's like, okay. Well, anyways, to <laughs> Turn to your Bibles to Matthew chapter 5, uh, Gospel according to Matthew chapter 5. We are going to continue to learn how to use the prize that we have been training for. Each of us in our lives, each of us live our lives in a way that we should be living our lives in a way in which we gain a prize. The prize will be different from person to person. We all have a prize that we want at the end of our life or that we are trying to gain each day in our lives. And we have this prize, and some people that prize can be money, some people that prize can be prestige, some people can that prize could just be finishing life and getting out of this world. In 1 Corinthians 9, Paul talks about training our bodies not to, not to be disqualified for this prize. We're supposed to be training in a certain way where we are not disqualified in the race to get the prize, but we train in a way to win the prize, to earnestly work with that prize. It is a prize that, cannot be, that can be obtained here today, and unfortunately for many of us, that prize, we feel, is obtained in eternity. And we've been talking about this. What is that prize? Life. Life. We can have life here on this earth, and we can have life in eternity. In the Gospel of Jesus, according to Matthew, there is a recurring theme of the kingdom of God. The word kingdom is used 54 times in the book of Matthew. Matthew is very good at understanding and explaining the kingdom of God. He has taken Jesus' words and really has emphasized what the kingdom of God is, how we can experience this kingdom, and where this kingdom is at. We see this in the prayer that Jesus taught us to pray when he says, Jesus says, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And for Jesus in that prayer, the whole idea is that we can experience God's kingdom here on earth, here in our everyday life. We can be actively involved, actively in the kingdom of of God. Each day of our lives should be centered around the kingdom of God and how we live that life. This is the whole point of Jesus' teaching according to Matthew. It is a new way of doing life. In a sense, as I was studying, I real I was studying, one of the people that I was reading said that this is a new ethic, a new a kingdom ethic. And what Jesus is doing is he's going to establish a kingdom ethic, a new ethic that the people need to follow. We see this in Matthews 5, 6, and 7, which we call the Sermon on the Mount. Basically, the Sermon on the Mount has taken the Old Testament law, the Ten Commandments, and he has stretched them to become even more uh, to be, to, to, he has stretched them to, be, to, to turn them in from things that we do into things who we are, who we become. The, purposes of the, uh, the purpose of the Sermon on the Mount was to teach people how to live. 
and what to do. It is a new ethic, a new way of doing things. And it was a radical ethic. It was a radical change in our lives. Because Jesus is basically telling these people on the side of the hill, okay, hey, look, I want you to live a life where you have no regrets. You know, you, that's what Jesus really wants us to do. He wants us to have a life where there are no regrets in our life. He wants us to live a certain way where we can be blessed by God and God can bless us and we can bless other people. And, and God sets up this, this new ethic, this new way of doing life. He starts with, in chapter 5, what we call the Beatitudes. I call the blessing. If you want to be blessed, Jesus says, if you want to have a new life, a new way of doing things, a new morality, a new ethic, then this is who you become. And if you want to be blessed, you know, we all want to be blessed. Believe it or not, God, God you know, <laughs> blessings don't come in green. Just think about that for a while. <laughs> green. What color is money? There you go. Blessings don't come in green. Blessings don't come in cars. Blessings don't come in things. Blessings is who we are. And, and Matthew says, or Jesus says, blessings are experienced by being poor in spirit, mourning, meek, hungering, hungering and thirsting at, for righteousness, merciful, pure in heart, peacemaker, persecuted, because we are living a life of righteousness. He has taken the Old Testament Ten Commandments. He said, you think those are tough? Here you go. I'm going to stretch them. I'm going to make them more meaningful. They are now relational. They are now not just things that we do, but they are what we have become. Instead of doing good things and, hey, look at this. I gave to the church. I... I, I, I walked a little lady across the street. Uh, Raymond didn't pick on me this week. That's for everybody who was here last week. Anyways. <laughs> yeah, he's glaring at me back there. <laughs> and so it is a new way of doing things. And so instead of doing things, we become something. A new way, a new life, we begin to practice certain principles of love. This new ethic is a new principle in love. <clears throat> Before a decision is made, the question is whether this shows the love of Christ to the people involved. Before we open up our mouth, where will my words show the love of Christ? Before I do something, will I be showing the love of Christ? Before I go somewhere, will I be showing the love of Christ? If it doesn't express Jesus' love, then we have to determine whether it should or should not be done. Because everything a follower of Jesus wants to do is to share the love of Jesus to the people around them. And if I'm unable to share that love of Jesus, I need to make a difference. Because the whole aspect of the Sermon on the Mount changes a doing work into this is how you love people. When we have been given a new life, we want that life controlled by the love that Jesus showed us by becoming our, by the, the love that Jesus showed us by becoming our, his, our final. Ugh. Wow. Let's try that one more time. Okay. When we have been given a new life, we want, that, we want that life controlled by the love of Jesus, which he showed us by becoming our final sacrifice. Everything that Jesus did was out of love for people. He spoke out of love. He, 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 he disciplined out of love. He did everything out of love. And when he went to the cross, it was the greatest form of love that he could show. This is true love that is, that is what we were created to be, a, a person of love. And he is saying, here is a new ethic. This is how you treat people. You no longer treat people with disrespect. But now you are blessed because of the way you live your life. 
not what you get. Old Testament was all about getting stuff. I have sheep. I'm blessed. I have children. I'm blessed. And Jesus is now saying, you're blessed by what you are doing for people. Not just the people you like, <laughs> but the people who are difficult. The people that rub you the wrong way. Loving the people that are different, speak different, act different, live differently. And we are supposed to then reach out to those people and not be an inward person, but understand the concept of love. And Jesus spells this out in a couple of metaphors in Matthew chapter 5, 13 to 16. And he uses three metaphors to explain what we are, what kingdom people are supposed to be like. He talks about this new kingdom ethic, about the Beatitudes and how you're supposed to live for other people. And then in, in, then in verse 13, he wants to describe what we are, through, wh how kingdom people are supposed to live, okay, what they're supposed to be like. And then he goes on with the rest of the sermon now and says, different acts, different ways of projecting that. So Marcus is going to come and read Matthew 5, 13 through 16. You are the salt of the earth, but if the salt loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled underfoot. You are the light of the world. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on its stand and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. Jesus starts out in this little, he starts out in the Sermon on the Mount. And he gives three metaphors. And one of the metaphors that he used is Jesus said that we should be sodium chloride. Every single one of us should, should have some sort of sodium and chloride sitting around the house and we become salt. Salt of the earth. The metaphor really doesn't translate well into the 21st century America. Jesus talks about losing our saltiness. And we really, the salt that we use on the table really is not the same kind of salt that they used back in Jesus' time. The salt that we use on the table has been refined. It is not the same sodium chloride that we have sitting in our houses today. It's been refined, that has been refined, and all the impurities have been taken out of it. The salt of the Sermon on the Mount had, a, had different chemicals in it. And it wasn't really to give flavor all the time as much as it was to preserve something. Although it did add flavors to food, but most of it was preserved. And what would happen over time is that the salt content of this material of this chemical would actually dissolve and then you were left with this piece of rock or gran granulate that is it it would be this piece of granulate that really has no taste and it actually tastes bad today you can't really take the saltiness out of our salt because that's all it was but in Jesus's time you could actually take the salt out of the granule that they called salt and it wouldn't taste very good it became useless, and it, beca and, it, and it became useless, and Jesus basically said that it would be trampled under our feet, thrown out. We use salt for, for, say, uh, we use salt for flavor. Jesus used it mostly, as I said, for, um, to preserve things. People have, tried to people have attempted to identify all of the uses for salt, and kind of drag that all into this metaphor. And it's really hard to do that. But I like the metaphor of preserving. That salt is used to preserve. 
And I believe that the preservation of people is what Jesus is trying to teach. We are to preserve people's lives. We are not supposed to be tearing them down. When we preserve people's lives, we add flavor to their lives. When we are tearing people apart and, 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 and we're just disgusted at people's behavior and disgusted at people or certain groups of people, it rips them apart and we lose our saltiness. We lose our flavoring. We're not preserving life of other people. We're destroying life. Our words and action can preserve a person or destroy them. In a sense, we are to add flavor through our words and actions. Just to make sure we all understand, we are to be salt, not salty. <laughs> because when we become salty, we be, I don't know if you've ever salted something too much. Yeah. <laughs> when, one time when I was a child growing up, my mom and dad were making pasta, and uh, they put it on the stove, and dad put the water in, my, or mom put the water in, put the pasta in, put some salt in. Dad came by and put some salt in. <laughs> mom decided to add a little more salt. Dad didn't think he had enough salt. And then after they made this pasta, and we ate it, we're like, oh. See, we can become too salty and distasteful to the world because we force ourselves on the world instead of loving the world. Love preserves people. It preserves life. It gives life and helps people along to, in order so that they can have flavor. Flavor can be added to them. Sometimes kingdom people think that they are supposed to be salty people. They're not. They're supposed to be different. And the difference that they're supposed to be is how they love each other. The next metaphor that Jesus uses is light. We are to be the light of the world. We are to illuminate the darkness in people's lives, to help them see the light. John, uh, in, in John's Gospel 8, 12, he records Jesus saying to a crowd of people, he says, Jesus is saying this to a crowd of people, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. And Jesus is also telling us to be the light of the world, meaning when Jesus is living in us, we are not supposed to be living dark, gloomy, sad lives Okay, everything stinks, but I'm just, okay, we're, you know, we're not supposed to be waking up in the morning and going, oh, wow, it's cloudy and gloomy out. I guess I'll just stay home from church today because I just don't feel like going. We're not supposed to be gloomy. We're supposed to be joyous. We're supposed to be the light of the world. And when things hit us and hard things happen to us, we're supposed to shine the light. Now, we always think that this, this, this metaphor of being the light of the world, the being the light to the world, is a lighthouse. And we, we constantly use the lighthouse theme of being a beacon of light. Unfortunately, I don't think Jesus knew what a lighthouse was since the first lighthouse was built in Boston in 1716. 1,720 years after Jesus was born. So I'm not sure if Jesus actually knew what a lighthouse was. What he was saying was that we are supposed to be a light, a lampstand, that we are supposed to be beaming light to all the people, that when you walk into a room, instead of being part of the darkness in that room, we are supposed to be part of the, we are supposed to be a light to that room to allow everybody to see. We're not supposed to stand and be battered by the wind while this light is going around and around and, and, and beckoning people to come. We are supposed to be a light that goes out in the world and shows people the light of Jesus because guess where our light came from? Jesus. And when we have Jesus in our lives, we are supposed to be a positive influence 
on the people around us. And we're not supposed to be allowing the culture and people to change us. We are supposed to be changing the world and showing the world that there is a new way to living. Not beating on people and saying, oh, you shouldn't do this, you shouldn't dress that way, you shouldn't act that way, you shouldn't be this way. But showing them the light of Jesus. We are supposed to be positive people. I know, some of you call it realism. I just being realistic about life. I know. But I like being around people who are positive and have the hope of Jesus in them. And in the midst of sorrow, we can see Jesus working and be in awe of what Jesus is doing. The third metaphor that Jesus uses is a city on the hill. A city on a hill is seen by everybody. A city that stands up above everybody. You can drive around, walk around, do whatever you're doing, and you look up and you see this city. I'm not sure if Jesus is specifically referring to a, a actual city or just sharing something, it's just sharing about any city that sits up on the hill is obviously going to be seen. He's not referring to Jerusalem because Jerusalem had hills and parts of Jerusalem were on hills, but Jerusalem was not on this big mountaintop on this hill that everybody could see. They think that Jesus might have been referring to his his home city, Nazareth, because Nazareth sat on the side of the hill, and when you approached Nazareth, you could see Nazareth's lights. Either way, whatever Jesus was referring to is that he is referring that we are to be a city in which people can see us, in which, in which the light of Jesus is shining, and we are the hope of the world. And as the world is walking around and the world is struggling, they can see a church who is overcoming the world, who's not running away, afraid of their world, who is not hiding in their homes, who is not scared of what might be happening tomorrow, but is alive in Jesus and is a light to the world around us, and people can see that light. Kingdom people are to be a city of hope. Our church is to be a city of hope. The one thing that we have that nobody that you, that the world does not have and the one thing that we should be proclaiming that the world struggles with is this hope in Jesus that no matter how bad it is Jesus will be there and I can go to a church and gain the, the and gain the support and comfort that I need. I can go somewhere where I'm welcome. I can go somewhere where they know my name. They know my name. This is what the church should be. It is important that we do not lose perspective, (coughs) but we do not lose our perspective as what we are supposed to be, but we become a city on a hill in Monongahela where people will find the hope of Jesus in our lives. We can turn the lights on in this building all we want. It's not going to attract people. We can put articles in the newspaper. It's not going to attract people. What's going to attract people to this building is the people of the Monongahela Church of the Nazarene who are the light of the world, bringing bringing people into our city, which is you and me. What is a city made up of? People. So we can understand that Jesus is trying to help us understand what it's like to be kingdom people. We're supposed to be salt, preserving people's lives. We're supposed to be the light of Jesus beaming out of us. And we're supposed to be a city on the hill in which people can see. That brings us to the final thing. How do we live this out? What what, what do king, how does kingdom people practice kingdom living? How is this practice outside in this world? Well, first, kingdom people live 
<coughs> kingdom living is about, is about living according to the gospel. If we are following Jesus, there is an ethic that goes beyond the Beatitudes. And Jesus begins to talk about that new ethic throughout the entire Sermon on the Mount. A new relationship with people. A new way of treating people. The entire Sermon on the Mount is about living as if we have received the grace of Jesus in our lives. Jesus changes the doing to please Jesus changes the doing to please God to living because we love God. We have to start stop doing to please God. We have to stop doing things because there is an angry God, an angry Father up in heaven who's got this big lightning bolt, and he's ready to just go, boom, and destroy someone's life. But we have to begin to understand that the gospel of Jesus Christ changes us. And we can't, and when we have received that gospel of Jesus Christ, we can't cheapen it by living the same way we continued, the, the same way that we were living before we came face to face with Jesus. We cheapen grace when we don't make lifestyle changes that goes along with the change that Jesus wants us to make in our lives. Not just in the things we do, but in the way we live our lives. My favorite scripture is, is 1 Corinthians 2.2. 2. I've lived by the scripture. It's who I am. It's what I am. It's how everything in my life is surrounded. Paul is very in earnest to let the Corinthian church know one thing and one thing only. He didn't care about all the griping that was going on. He didn't care if the carpeting was red, blue, or yellow. He didn't care what was happening in the church's homes. He didn't care if this person was holy or that person was holy. He didn't care who was circumcised and who wasn't circumcised. He didn't care what dress you wore in. He didn't care. He didn't make a whole list of things. And he just blurts out in his letter to the Corinthian church, he says, For I resolved to know nothing while I was with you except Jesus Christ in him crucified. That's all I want to know. I want to know about Jesus. I want to wake up and just learn about Jesus. I want to be engulfed with Jesus because kingdom living is about Jesus. It's about everything we do is about Jesus and learning about Jesus and loving Jesus and being in the love of Jesus. It's being so radical that Jesus just fills your life. That you see somebody on the street who is hurting and you might go up to them and give them a couple bucks. So what? They might use it? No, who cares? You start doing crazy things like loving your neighbor. You know, the neighbor that lives next door. You know, the grumpy person. One of the words that I... <coughs> nah, I'm not going to there. <laughs> Something came to my mind. I'm going to say that one out. Anyways... <laughs> That we just learn to love old, old, old people, we, like me. Um, <laughs> you know, that really hurt. And when you start talking about old people, you're like, I'm almost sick. All right, never mind. Anyways, we start loving people, no matter who they are, because that's what's more important. There is nothing more important for Paul than Christ's crucifixion, because Christ's crucifixion gave him life and gave him hope. And that's all what Paul wanted to do when he went into all these cities was to tell people who do not know about Jesus, about Jesus. Not that you're living the wrong way, but that I have a person who can give you life and you can rise up from the life that you are living and become a new creation and have the hope of this world. I'm sorry, the hope in this world and the hope of eternity. We don't have to sit there waiting for the end time. We can live in the hope of Jesus today. Kingdom living understands the need for the gospel. Kingdom living is about understanding that people need the gospel of Jesus. That the gospel of Jesus is, is beautiful. It is pure. It is a wonderful message. It is a message for the entire human race. It's not just a message for one group of people, but it's a message for everybody. 
It is a message of God becoming one of us, becoming human. It is a message of God knowing what it means to be a human. Because human, being human stinks. It hurts. It's painful. And Jesus became one of us, and he got messy in life. And he, got, and he hung, out, <laughs> hung out with sinners. And he hung out with the religious. And he hung out with different people, outcasts. He hung out with the poor. He hung out with the middle class. <laughs> And believe it or not, Jesus hung out with the rich. <laughs> and he didn't pit one class against another. He said, we are all one in God. And he died for every single person. We need to understand that we have a calling to tell people about this man who can bring hope and forgiveness into their lives. People need this message, and it is up to us to share it with those that need it. Kingdom people, kingdom living makes a difference in people's lives. Kingdom living means that we, are, that, that we see that we, we act. Kingdom me, living means that we add value to people by loving them. People don't need to be told what they're doing wrong. They already know they need someone to listen to how messy their life is. And that's all that people just need sometimes, is somebody who's going to sit and listen to the heartache, to the pain of life. They interact with them throughout the week. They want to know them. You know, it's very easy to communicate nowadays with a text message. Just a simple text message. You have no idea what it means when you get a text message and someone just says, I'm praying for you right now, or sends a prayer. We can communicate with people so much. But you know the one thing that people want more than anything? They want people to know their names. And what I find a little frustrating in a church our size is that when you look around, there are some people here this morning that you don't know their name. And we got to get past that where we know everybody's name. Well, I don't know their name. You know that, you know that, that family up over there that was sitting in the corner with those kids that were kind of making noise? Yeah, what's their names? I don't know. Do you? No. Why don't you go up and ask them? Well, you know. People want the church to basically just know their name so they can feel like they belong. Hey, can I have your cell phone this week? I want to text you some things. I know it's tough. It's tough with two little kids. I know things aren't going well for you. Can I text you? Can I call you? Oh, can I invite you out to dinner or lunch? Can I spend some time with you? You see, in order to grow this church, in order that we continue to, to love people and to move forward, we have to not only reach out to the people that we know, but when people come into our church, we need to know their name. You know, I'd rather somebody, <laughs> I'd rather somebody who comes new to this church walk out of there and say, man, too many people welcomed me. Can you believe how many people asked me my name and my phone number? Are they all crazy? I'd rather somebody complain that too many people got, in their, got, into, their, uh, got into their life and wanted to know who they were. And, hey, why don't you come over to dinner? Why don't you do this? And then, you know, and then they walk out of church, and I ask, do you know what that couple's name was that was in church this morning? No. That's why they're not going to be back. Because no one knows their name. No one said to them, hey, can I sit with you? Hey, can I talk to you about the church this week? You know, might be a little odd, might be a little free, but so what? <laughs> when I was growing up, when I was a youth pastor, um, I should have brought it in. 
But I just thought of it right now. When I was a youth pastor, uh, DC Talk had, had a, and I should have played the song for you too this morning. DC Talk had a great song out. It was called Jesus Freaks. And um, talks about, you know, don't you want to be a Jesus freak? And, and it talks in there about some people might find out it's true. And so my, I had an office, and uh, some of the kids came into my office, and, they, and we painted the office white, and they put handprints and names, and they drew all. And when I was gone one day, uh, one of the kids wrote, Jesus freak, on my wall. Wigged out my senior pastor, <laughs> my boss. How oh, could I'm not a freak. Yes, you are. No, I'm not. I'm not. Yes, you are. You're different. You're a freak. And so when I left, they cut out the Jesus part. I wanted him to cut out the whole phrase, but he refused to. I should have gone up there before, right before I left and cut that part out of the wall. Because that's what we are. We are Jesus. We're supposed to be acting like Jesus freaks. Boy, oh, those people are a little freaky over there because they just are so wanting to know who I am. They so much wanted to express the people of love. You see, it's not the gospel that the world has a problem with. It's not the message of Jesus Christ. It's not the people who, it's, it, it's not what Jesus did on the cross. It's not that this message is 4,000, 6,000, 8,000 years old. It's not that it's outdated. It's the people who present the message to them. And Jesus says, I have given you this great, beautiful, wholesome message. It is, called this, it is called the gospel of Jesus Christ, my death and resurrection. Here, I showed you what it means. You experienced it. Now go out and sh share it and live it. Because it's one thing to confess it. It's another thing to go out and be the salt to the world, light and a city of hope. That's what we need to become, people. And guess what? I've been here 24 years, and I can't do it myself. So I give you the right to go out and be salty <laughs> and full of the light of Jesus and bring them into this city of so they can experience the same friendships and love that we are experiencing. So are you willing to do it? It's between you and Jesus. When you see that person, your next door neighbor, when you see that friend, co-worker, person who's crying at a table, person struggling to pay for food, clothing. What are you willing to do? How far are you willing to go? Let's pray. Lord, we want to be salt to the earth, light of the world, and a city on a hill. change us from the inside out. Help us to learn to be kingdom people and to live the kingdom way. We thank you, God.
may you shine brightly as a beacon of hope, a radiant, a radiant reflection of God's divine love for us. In a world shrouded in darkness, may your light illuminate the, the path for others, guiding them towards peace, kindness, and truth. Go forth and let your light shine, for you are the light of the world. Please stand as we sing the doxology. Enjoy this day that God has created for you. Y'all are dismissed.